this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Again this evening in collaboration with my wonderful brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, over there, the big blue ocean in Iowa in the United States of America. Hello Tom, how are you doing? Hello Jörg, and nice to be here and looking forward to getting on with the study. It's the and, 20th uh, reading today already, yeah? can you believe it? Wow, it's hard <laughs> to believe, time flies and... Uh, I hope the listeners appreciate uh, the time that we've spent and the effort we've expended to bring them the truth. It's uh, very rare and uh, hard to find, especially in the churches. That's true, but you know, always before we do this reading, uh, I put in premiere the video of the reading of the week before. And today we have had on my channel, therefore, a few new listeners and also a few more uh, new people who commented. And the comments were quite, um, how do you say that, hopeful, uh, hope-giving, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. People who really say, oh, I got it, I understand this, I understand that. And speaking about, well, how can you not understand <laughs> that Jesus Christ was the utterly fulfillment of Daniel's chapter uh, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And, you know, yes, but we, we, things... we have to be careful and, and acknowledge that uh, all the churches for so long, have taught futurism, that, that, the, that the truth, the historicist truth, is so rare and unheard of in this country that it's not easily comprehended and not easily digested and not easily accepted since virtually no one in this country, uh, as a percentage at least of the Christian population, has ever heard historicism before, has ever even heard of historicism. The, but the fact of the matter is, up until about 1805 or 1810, thereabouts, in England, no one had ever heard the word futurism. And every Christian before that time was a historicist. 
They believed in the historical fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, known as the 70 weeks of Daniel. And they believed that it was fulfilled completely and perfectly by Messiah the Prince, Jesus Christ, just exactly the way Daniel prophesied it as given to him by the angel Gabriel. And, uh, and of course, here's the kicker of all this. If you are of the historicist camp, like every Christian was prior to about 1805 or 1810, you knew that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. You didn't believe in a future fulfillment of any portion of that 70 weeks of Daniel. It was all fulfilled in, the, in history during the life of Christ. The se seven-year period of time, beginning with his baptism until the stoning of Stephen and the baptism of Cornelius. And, uh, and uh, since no one looked for any future fulfillment, since Jesus was the fulfillment, then they began immediately, just like Paul told them to do, was to look for the rise of Antichrist. And don't expect Christ's return until that man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition, the one who puts himself in a temple of God and says that he is God, the one who thinks to change times and laws and fulfill the prophecies of Daniel, the metal man image, right? the, little, the little horn, the beast. And Paul admonished the Christians, keep your eye open for the rise of the man of sin, the counterfeit Christ. And uh, as we learn in the book from Henry Grattan Guinness, uh, that the early Christians, those who sat under Paul's ministry and, and generations immediately thereafter, prayed for the longevity of the Caesars of the Roman Empire. Even as wicked and, and persecutorial as it was against Bible-believing Christians, living in a Roman Empire was far better than living in the, the empire of the Antichrist. And they knew just as soon as these Roman Caesars were taken out of the way, the, these Roman Caesars who were up till now preventing or resisting the rise of the man of sin, once they were taken out of the way, then the papacy could rise to power. And uh, so they knew who the Antichrist was even before the word was known. They just knew that it was the Roman power that would replace the Caesars. And uh, to speak of these generations as though any portion of the 70th week of Daniel, uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel was, was, uh, was future, in, in, a, in any way detached from the 69th week, well, they, would have, they wouldn't have understood. They wouldn't have comprehended. They would have and left you to scorn, left. Tom. They would have and left you to certain. scorn. Well, absolutely. And they would never entertain the possibility that Jesus was not the 70th week of Daniel. That Jesus Messiah, the prince, was not the 70th week of Daniel. And his ministry, you know, to say, if you were to tell a, a, a Christian back then that the 70th week of Daniel was future, why, they would immediately return to you by saying, well, then you deny that Jesus that Messiah has come in the flesh. And that's the point we are going to make tonight, Tom. That's the Be point that is so important. Back Be to you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Because you, you, you just gave me the, the, the word to start um, a little bit explanation about the point that we are going to look into tonight. Um, two uh, chapters before, in chapter 7 of the book of the End Time Delusions, the book that we are come together here to read from... Uh, Steve Wahlberg, uh, we read about Antichrist, facts and fiction. Yeah? And in this part of the book, um, there were many verses, as you can see here, um, that read that uh, Jesus Christ came in the flesh and the spirit of Antichrist denies Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So that means the spirit of Antichrist 
who is then the spirit of Antichrist or who is the Antichrist? Now we can nail that a little bit even deeper to the papacy because the papacy has a dogma in which it uh, teaches to everyone sitting in the pews and everyone else that Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, was born immaculate. She was born without sin. That means she was not of the same flesh as everybody else. And Jesus came forth out of her flesh. And therefore, Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh of man. And that is a very important point we didn't address when we were doing this um, subject, this, uh, this chapter of this video, or the chapter of the reading. And Tom, a few years ago, I think in 2009, 2010 thereabouts, read a wonderful book from three, uh, I'm ashamed almost to say, authors who are uh, futurist in their biblical understanding for a very big part, Jim Tetlow, Roger Oakland and Brad Myers, but they wrote a wonderful book about the Queen of All, Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of All. How the Marian apparitions plan to unite all religions under the Roman Catholic Church. When you read this book, you will understand that the Roman Catholic Church identifies herself as the Queen of Heaven itself. Yeah? The Virgin Mary and the Queen of Rome and, and, and the Roman Catholic Church are one and the same. That is something that you learn when you go through that book that Tom read in the time. I haven't read that book, but I heard Tom read that book and discuss that book, and I met a German Christian brother who was willing to translate that book into German, and he did, and we do uh, we did for the moment up to the chapter 9 of 10 chapters, about 50 readings of that book. And it is very important to me that we speak to you a little bit about this dogma of the Roman Catholic Church that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh because that's the spirit of Antichrist. This is 1 John 4, 3. And this is fulfilled in the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, don't believe my word. I'm going to show you from the Roman Catholic Church and affiliated sites exactly what they are saying. I have found here a website that is called Mary de Nazareth, which is French, uh, Mary of Nazareth, it would, uh, it would be in English. And in this site you find the dogma of the Immaculate Conception that is from 1854. That means that is during the time of the longest pontificate a pontiff or a Roman Catholic Antichrist had ever had, I think 32 years altogether from 1846 to 1878, if I'm not mistaken, that is Pope Pius IX, or Pio Nono, as he is also called. And he made the Immaculate Conception of Mary Roman Catholic dogma in his, uh, uh, in his apostolic constitution. Uh, that's, uh, that's a word that you read here. Now, to understand what an apostolic constitution is, even before we go into the text, I open to you an explanation of what are the constitutions. And this is from newadvent.org, and that is a Roman Catholic encyclopedia website that is uh, done, that is maintained, and that is filled with all the information here by the Roman Catholic Church and their affiliates themselves. The papal constitutions, what does it say? We only read the first paragraph or about the first paragraph to give you an idea. Papal constitutions are ordinations issued by the Roman pontiffs or the Antichrist and binding those for whom they are issued, whether they be for all the faithful or for special classes or for individuals. From the earliest times, the quote-unquote Christians of the whole world have consulted the popes on all matters pertaining faith, morals and discipline. Well, if that's true, I'm sorry, they should have consulted Jesus Christ and not the Pope. But that's, that's another exactly subject. Right. <laughs> the earliest instance is the well-known appeal from Corinth to 
Pope Clement I during the lifetime of St. John the Apostle in the first century of the Christian era. If I had a red pen, I would erase this whole sentence in red because it's lie after lie after lie because St. John the Apostle never was in Rome. Yeah? It was, uh, or, or Peter, it was um, Paul who was in Rome and no other apostle. Yeah? Um, from that time on, requests or decisions on various ecclesiastical matters were addressed to the Holy See from all parts of the known world, and the answers that were received were reverenced as proceeding from the mouth of Christ's chief apostle and his vicar on earth. And we all know that the vicar of Christ is a title of the papacy, and that is an anti-Christian title because the only true vicar of Christ here on earth is the Holy Spirit and not a man. Yeah? The fact that the decrees of church councils, whether general, provincial, or even diocesan, were anciently as a rule forwarded to the Pope for his revision or confirmation, gave occasion for many papal constitutions during the early ages. After the time of Constantine the Great, yeah, he is the one that uh, made quote unquote, Christianity, the state religion of the pagan Rome in 321, owing to greater liberty allowed to the church, such intercourse with the apostolic see became more frequent and more open. St. Jerome in the 4th century testifies to the number of responses requested to the sovereign, of the sovereign pontiff from both the Eastern and Western Church during the time he acted as secretary to Pope Damascus. So because you have still a split of the Eastern and Western Church, means you have the Church of Byzantium or Constantinople, where the emperor resided, and the Western Church, where only the Bishop of Rome resided, this is still not a pope. All the people they call popes before the 7th century are no popes, but are bishops of Rome. Yeah? And here you already have the uh, division between the two churches. So there was not one universal pontiff or... Uh, bishop at that time, as later in the 7th century by Boniface III, but that's again another subject. That these papal responses soon began to constitute an important section of canon law is evident from statements in the letters of various Roman pontiffs. Now, uh, the, that these papal responses soon began to constitute an important section of canon law is something I want Tom to go a little bit deeper into explanation because of all the readings that he did, Rome and Civil Liberty by James Edgar Wiley, The History of Romanism by John Dowling, The, Vatican, uh, the Global Vatican by um, uh, Francis Rooney and all these other books, Tom has a much deeper understanding and can explain himself much, much better than I can to tell you what that means that if something is taken into canon law, what is what does that mean to all of us, Tom? Please explain that a little bit because I know that you have much better words than me to explain that to our listeners. Well, this definition, that which we're reading, uh, uh, gives us the clue that uh, these uh, these uh, constitutions and decretals of the popes become a portion of Roman Catholic canon law. Roman Catholic canon law is the laws and decrees and papal bulls uh, and encyclicals of the popes. Okay? And they're considered to be the laws of the church. And uh, this is how the papacy and the Roman Catholic church fulfills uh, the Bible prophecy, which says that the little horn will think to change times and laws. Okay? The, these papal encyclicals, uh, constitutions, papal bulls, all these other official writings of the popes are added to Roman Catholic canon law as if they were the law of God. And this, this definition says that these laws apply to those to, for whom the papacy says they are written. But he doesn't say who they are written for. The fact of the matter is, God's law, as they see Roman Catholic canon law, applies to all men. All men must answer to Christ and the vicar of Christ. And the papacy literally replaces Christ and replaces divine law, uh, and namely the Ten Commandments, with Roman Catholic canon law. 
just as the Pope replaces Christ in the world, Roman Catholic canon law replaces the divine law. And then, Tom, we have to understand that uh, whenever the Roman Catholic Church or the Vatican signs a concordat with a country, that country agrees that every civil law they make is in accordance with Roman Catholic canon law. Yes, and this is assuming that your listeners have ever even heard the term concordat. A concordat, for those who have never heard the term and don't know what it means, it's a legally binding contract or agreement. And and really, it's not even fair to call it a contract or an agreement. Because it's more a pact. <laughs> because contracts and agreements can be amended or changed. What a concordat is, is a binding law upon a nation and the government of that nation. And there are terms of this binding law which eventually lead to the law of that nation being adopted that makes Roman Catholicism the official religion of that nation and also binds that government and the taxpayers of that nation to finance the church, to finance and support the Roman Catholic Church and to defend it. And... Uh, defend it against persecution or uh, defend it against loss of her properties. In other words, confiscation of the properties that the churches, the land, the uh, orphanages, the hospitals, every piece of land in the country that is claimed by the Roman pontiff must be protected by that government by force if necessary so that Rome has secure ownership of her property and uh, it can't be taken away from her either by thieves or by the government okay so it's a binding law forcing the government to adopt roman catholicism forcing the government and its people to enforce uh, uh, the church's rights which are unlimited to to force national financial support of the church, in other words, taxpayer-funded, and uh, every other abomination. That's what a concordat is. It's a binding decree by the papacy upon the government of that nation, making Roman Roman Catholicism the official taxpayer-funded religion and, adopt, and, and commands the military of the nation to defend Roman Catholic rights and to, and to protect her property from confiscation. In other words, to guarantee peaceful continuance and extension of the papal power within that nation of, uh, 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 against all opposition foreign or domestic. Can I just put a few words into here, Tom? Certainly. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be all right to say at the moment when the nation signs a concordat with the Vatican, that is when the Vatican uh, accepts the government of that country as de jure instead of de facto? That's right. Du jour and de facto are terms that your your listeners, uh, our listeners, I've been corrected, uh, may or may not have ever heard. But there's only one legitimate government in the world, according to the papacy, and that is one that is totally subservient to the papal power, the civil and religious power of the pope. Now, every other nation in the world that is that, that either does not concede to Rome's, the Vatican, or the papacy's spiritual power, or a nation perhaps that receives and acknowledges the Pope's religious power, but does not, really, does, 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 does not uh, regard the Pope's claim of king of kings, his civil power, the papacy calls that nation a de facto or a government in fact that may be overthrown at any time given the right circumstances 
that will minimize damage to the church. Okay? A, a, a de facto government is a government, in fact, in other words, it's on the ground, it's visible, it controls the country and its people, but it's assigned for uh, a, a permanent overthrow by the Pope at the, at the earliest convenience. A de jure government, on the other hand, is a government wholly approved by the Pope, a government that, without reservation, accepts the Pope's spiritual power as if he were God on earth, and also accepts the temporal power or the civil power of the Pope as King of Kings. And that means that the king or the, or, or the queen or the president uh, of that country bends the knee to the Pope as if he were God on earth and he is, he is then the Pope's vassal in the kingdom and does whatever the Pope tells him to do. I think and Tom, is as yeah, sorry to interrupt to you. The Pope, as as faithful to the Pope as he would be if if he were Christ Himself. Uh, sorry to interrupt you here, Tom. It is very interesting what you say. It is absolutely correct, but I think this has to be enough for our listeners to understand, because mm -hmm. now they understand what the papal constitution inhales, and they also understand when this website speaks of this is about the dogma of the Immaculate Conception that is an apostolic constitution. Right. So with all the consequences that you just named of the quote-unquote law, what the Roman Catholic Church calls it, this dogma of the Immaculate Conception was put out in the Roman Catholic Church. And whenever you are affiliated in any way, shape or form to the Roman Catholic Church, you have to accept this dogma of Immaculate Conception. And this reads, quote, We declare, pronounce and define that the doctrine which holds that the Most Blessed Virgin Mary, in the first instance of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of your human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God and therefore to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. I dare everybody watching this to find anything what is mentioned in this little paragraph in the Bible. They make the Virgin Mary of a different flesh than all of us because she was by a quote-unquote singular grace and quote-unquote singular privilege granted by Almighty God, and I don't know which God they are talking about, but surely not Elohim of the Bible, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved from all stain of original sin. All stain of original sin. I mean, original sin is again another subject that is, of course, a wrong uh, Roman Catholic teaching. But the point is that she was born of a sinless flesh. And therefore she is not born of the same flesh as we are. And Jesus Christ only was, sinless, uh, was a, born in a sinless flesh because he was born of Mary. That's the Roman Catholic dogma of the Immaculate Conception. But this Here, is only can I, one. Can I impose a comment? Sure. This is only one page we go into, and there are three other pages where we go into in the Catholic Encyclopedia right along. But first, of course, we want to hear what Tom has to say. Well, this is another example how the prophecy is fulfilled that says he, he, the Antichrist, will think to change times and laws. That's from and Daniel, was, yeah. Yes, and, and the law says, Jesus said to Adam and Eve in the garden, the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Okay? Now, Adam and Eve are the progenitors of all mankind. And the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is given for man 
once to die and then the judgment. So all flesh comes under that curse. We all must die. But the Roman Catholic Church, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist says, no, God's law is not in effect. I say, as the vicar of Christ, Mary shall not die. Okay? And in commensurate with that Roman Catholic Antichrist dogma, they say that Mary didn't die. That, and this is the official teaching, you mu if you're Roman Catholic, you must believe this, that Mary did not die and go the way of all mankind into the grave. Roman Catholicism says as dogma that you must believe that Mary was miraculously assumed into heaven, passing death and going straight to heaven. She never died. Okay? But we all know Jesus died, didn't he? I mean, Roman Catholicism acknowledges that Jesus died. So it was Mary who was the, the God of the Roman Catholic Church. It's not Jesus. Jesus is not the Christ of the Roman Catholic Church. Jesus is not the Savior. Now, you'll hear Roman Catholics plainly tell you that Jesus is the Savior. But Roman Catholic dogma stipulates that Mary did not die. She was assumed into heaven because she was free of the curse that Jesus put upon all mankind in the Garden of Eden when they sinned. Mary was exempted from all of that. So she was special, and she gave to Jesus a different kind of flesh. All right? But it, Roman Catholicism acknowledges that Jesus died. All right? Now, he bore upon his body our sin. And he also took the curse of death away so that we might live. That is the truth. But Rome, on its very foundation, usurps the law of God and replaces it with their own. That's the very, de that's the very definition of anti-Christ. Okay? The papacy is nothing. You, you can't define the papacy as anything less than the replacement of God on earth the defiance of God on earth, the usurper of God on earth. And that's the way Christians of all generations prior to 1805 or 1810, that's just exactly how Christians, true Bible-believing Christians, perceived the papacy as the man of sin, the son of, uh, the son of perdition, the anti-Christ, the one who rivals Christ, the one who who replaces Christ on the earth, the one who rejects Christ and his Father. And uh, they were right. This cockamamie futurism that has been believed and taught in the, in the, in the so-called Christian churches since, uh, since the early 1800s is diabolical in its origin. And it's believed by every Christian. It's taught in all the churches almost without exception. And it has it has been it has become it has become orthodoxy in the Protestant and evangelical churches, and nothing could be further the, from the truth. Futurism is a diabolical lie, and it has grievous spiritual consequences that we must uh, purge out of our belief system and out of our churches, and replace our futurist pastors with historicist pastors. Back to you, Jörg. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, I prepared a little video here that I show during the uh, readings of the book uh, Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of All in German. And um, just this very first picture gives you an idea what the Roman Catholic Church really thinks about Mary. Uh, this is a German text. I will translate that for you into English. It says, This is the crowning of Mary through Jesus Christ on the left and God the Father on the right in the Church of Mary in Krakow in uh, Poland. 
Jesus Christ and God the Father are crowning Mary, and that's why she is their Queen of Heaven. This is how far they take it. This idolatry of even making a picture of God the Father, and of course a picture of Jesus Christ, and a picture of Mary, uh, an, an idol of Mary. What does the Bible say of idols? Can I make a comment here? Oh, please, Tom, whenever you the, feel like it. <laughs> Absolutely. The listeners, the listeners are going to be appalled at this idolatry and this imagery, these man-made images uh, that are said to represent Jesus on the left and God the Father on the right and Mary in the middle. And Mary is receiving a crown from both God and Jesus, the Father and the Son. And, and people are going to say, well, this isn't Roman Catholicism. That's not what the Roman Catholics teach or believe in this country. But listen, this is what's believed in Roman Catholic churches all over the world. And just because the Roman Catholic Church hasn't stooped to this state of idolatry and apostasy, in public at least, is because this country is so full of Protestants and evangelicals that would immediately uh, claim Ichabod. You know, this is this is a, 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 abominable, is what this is. This crowning of Mary as though she's the queen of heaven. I mean, even in our illiterate uh, apostate Protestant and evangelical churches, we know that Mary's not the God. Mary's not part of the Godhead. Mary was blessed. She was a handmaiden of the Lord. She bore Christ's body and gave him a human, a human form in this world and, and cooperated with the throne of glory so to bring forth our Messiah. But that's as far as it goes. Mary is regarded as blessed because she was hand-chosen of the Lord to be his handmaiden. But that's as far as it goes. There's no deity. There's no sinlessness. There's no different flesh between Mary and every other man that ever was born into the world. And uh, the deification of Mary is simply the pagan roots of Roman Catholicism visible for anyone to see that wishes to. The only reason these very same images are not carried about and touted in this country and by proud Roman Catholics is because they know they have to be careful of the pro Protestant and evangelical sentiments. They don't want to lose their status in, this, in, in civil life. They certainly don't want to lose their status in government, even in Washington, D.C. And so they try as best they can without being disloyal to the church to minimize uh, this type of idolatry. But trust me, and if you can get any Roman Catholic in, in private, they'll tell you that if Roman Catholicism wasn't under constraint by Protestant and evangelical sentiment in this country, they would be just like Poland. Roman Catholicism is the same all over the world, except where it's not convenient. And then Rome makes temporary uh, concession, but only for a time. If Roman Catholicism ultimately gains the same authority and respectability and uh, prestige in this country that it has in Poland, you'll see these same idolatrous images carried about in this country touting Mary as the, as the fount of all grace, that she was immaculately conceived, she was without mortal sin, she was sinless, and she bore Christ, and she is a, a mediator, a co-mediator with Christ, and is a mediator between God and men, and that she's a co-redemptrix, that it was through her that we are saved. And uh, it, it's only a matter of time if this ecumenical movement that was started in the 60s continues in its present course, Protestants and evangelicals will begin to say the same things. Just to make one thing sure, Tom, before anybody understands you wrong, the Roman Catholic Church says that Jesus is the only way to the Father, but the Roman Catholic Church also says only through Mary you come to Jesus. 
So are. they don't deny that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father. But they say we only come to Jesus through Mary. And if you don't have, and you can't have Mary if you can't have the Church. So if you're not part of the Roman Catholic Church, you cannot have Mary. That means you cannot come to Christ. That means you cannot be saved. That's how they work, you know. And this is just one picture. This movie is an hour long, and uh, I think every picture is shown about a minute and a half or two minutes. I don't know. Uh, we're probably not going to watch it all. Oh, that's not the point. We wanted to go into the articles. We wanted to go into the articles of Ma Mary of Nazareth, which we have gone through here. I don't go into all that site. You can read that for yourself. I will provide the links in the description box of this video for your own research, which is much more important than what Tom and I are saying in an hour, an hour and a half, because you don't don't have to believe us. You have to believe what you read and study for yourself and therefore we provide the sources even from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, from the New Advent site, the Immaculate Conception, it speaks the doctrine in the Constitution in Fabilis Deus of December 8, 1854, which we just read on this page, remind you. In that Constitution, Antichrist Excuse me for my adding of these words to the text. Pius the Ninth or Pius the Ninth, Pio Nono, pronounced and defined that the Blessed Virgin Mary, quote, in the first instance of her conception, by a singular privilege and grace granted by God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved exempt from all stain and, uh, uh, of original sin, unquote. The subject of this immunity from original sin is the person of Mary at the moment of the creation of her soul and its infusion into her body. The term conception does not mean the active or generative conception by her parents. No, 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 that's what you think. Her body was formed in the womb of the mother and the father and has usual, had the usual share in its formation. The question does not concern the immaculateness of the generative activity of her parents. Neither does it concern the passive conception absolutely and simply conceptio seminis carnis in, uh, in quarta. This is Latin. Conceptio seminis carnis. Carnis stands for fleshly. Yeah? This is the fleshly conception, which according to the order of nature precedes the infusion of the rational soul. The person is truly conceived when the soul is created and infused into the body. Mary was preserved exempt from all stain of original sin at the first moment of her animation and the sanctifying grace was given to her before sin could have taken effect in her soul. Now, just one little moment I want to spend about the person is truly conceived when the soul is created and infused into the body. Uh, can you show me a... Uh, Bible verse where this is mentioned. You will not find it, because this is needed in the Roman Catholic Church for the dogma of the eternal soul, where the Bible does not speak of an eternal or undying soul. The Bible surely says that when man was created, God gave through the nostrils of man, his breath of life into the man, and man became a living soul. This is not infusion of a soul into a body. The Bible says that the body became a soul through the breath of life God gave man of gifts to men. That is already a very, very big misunderstanding point that many people don't even fall about, even though it is written here clearly in black on white. Do you have a comment on that, what I said up to here, Tom? No, I certainly, certainly do, and common sense dictates that if a man became a living soul at the time that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, then it stands to reason that as soon as the breath of life leaves the man at death, he ceases to be a living soul. Exactly. And that's exactly the status that Mary holds today. She ceases to be a living soul. She is inanimate in the grave wherever she is, 
and she will remain in that state of ashes and dust until Christ comes and resurrects her from the grave the right with the with the resurrection of the righteous she's not a god she's not divine she's made of the same flesh and blood and bone that you and I are she was not free of original sin she was a sinner she claimed that god was her savior and no one needs a savior if they're without sin this is the diabolical nature of the Roman Catholic Church, to just dismiss the Word of God as though it is no effect and make up their own divine Word. That is the very definition of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who sits in a temple of God claiming himself to be God. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is. That's what the Pope is. And, and Yerk is not incorrect to replace the proper names of Pope Pius IX with the word Antichrist, because that's what he is. Back to you, Yerk. In the next sentence, so it says, Mary was preserved exempt from all stain of original sin at the first moment of her animation, and sanctifying grace was given to her before sin could have taken effect in her soul. The formal active essence of original sin was not removed from her soul as it is removed from others by baptism. <laughs> so you have to understand, baptism in the Roman Catholic Church is what? Exorcism. And when you study that a little bit for yourself, you will come to that conclusion too. Yeah? The formal active essence of original sin was not removed from a soul as it is removed from others by baptism. So when I, through baptism, remove from the soul original sin, then I drive out sin of the soul. And what is that? That is exorcism. It was excluded. It never was in her soul. Simultaneously with the exclusion of sin. The state of original sanctity, innocence and justice as opposed to original sin was conferred upon her by which gift every stain and fault and all depraved emotions, passions and debilities essentially pertaining to original sin were excluded. But she was not made exempt from the temporal penalties of Adam, from sorrow, bodily infirmities and death. I mean, if we wanted to go to, we, we, we could do 10, 15, maybe even 20 hours on, on this little article alone. But I think we will not bore you with an endless going deep into the study. We will leave that for yourselves. We just read this and say to you, whatever the Roman Catholic Church writes here, please show me one verse between Genesis and Revelation in the Holy Book where that is written down what the Roman Catholic Church states here. They suck this out of their thumb, out of nothing, like with their evolution theory of the Big Bang, that from nothing came everything because nothing wanted it so. The immunity from original sin, on the next paragraph we read, was given to Mary by a singular exemption from a universal law, <laughs> Catholic reads that, through the same merits of Christ by which other men are cleansed from sin by baptism. Mary needed the redeeming Savior to obtain this exemption and to be delivered from the universal necessity and debt of being subject to original sin. The person of Mary, in consequence of her origin form, uh, of, her, uh, of her origin from Adam, sorry, should have been subject to sin. But being the new Eve, who was to be the mother of the new Adam? She was, by the eternal counsel of God and the merits of Christ, withdrawn from the general law of original sin. Her redemption was the very masterpiece of Christ's redeeming wisdom. He is a greater redeemer who pays the debt that it may not be incurred than he who pays after it has fallen on the debtor. Such is the meaning of the term Immaculate Conception. I spare myself and Tom and you who are listening to go through the quote-unquote proof through scripture because here you can see how the Roman Catholic Church twists the scripture, especially in 
Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, which says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and your seed, and he shall crush thy head, and thou shalt crush his head. Um, uh, about that. The translation, she in the Vulgate is interpretive. Yeah? The Vulgate is, of course, a wrong translation of the Bible. And the point is that it speaks here of the woman, uh, of her, of the seed, is Mary. Yeah? The woman at enmity with the serpent is Mary. And that is all I go into the explanation of the wrong exegesis of the Roman Catholic Church of this Bible text, because everybody with two clear thinking um, cells in his brain understands that the woman is the church that is spoken about. Yeah? The church of Jesus Christ and not Mary in the understanding of Genesis 3.15. But we will leave now this new Advent article. We already read about the papal constitutions and uh, that is, by the way, just taken from uh, the constitution. Uh, I, I got that here from somewhere, the link, but I will put the same link into your uh, into your um, description box of this video. And here you can see from the Roman Catholic Church itself, Vatican.va archive, yeah, this is the archive of the Vatican itself, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, part one, the profession of faith. We speak here about article three, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And I'm not even going through all this I, 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 don't, I don't think it is necessary. We even have almost come to an hour of our broadcast without reading the book, and we will go into the book directly now. But I think that when you read through this article of the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, when you read through what are the papal constitutions, as Tom explained already, and you remember that you have governments de facto and de jure, and you know what, uh, and that a de facto government, that means a, fact, uh, a government that is in fact a government, but not accepted by the papacy, or doesn't accept the papacy, will only become a government de jure, that means a legal government, an accepted government by the Roman Catholic Church, if it signs a concordat. Therefore, you can read through this, you can read through the Catholic Encyclopedia, and you can read through this website. We will provide this for you in the description box of this video. I turn this uh, video down, even um, though I haven't really started it, because it makes me sick. <laughs> I have to tell you. And I think we are going to turn. Uh, we are going to turn now a little bit to the book that we actually wanted to read. This is about the end time delusion of Steve Wahlberg. But I think we made the point quite clear that you have to understand that the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary was made of a different flesh than all of mankind. And therefore, her son also was made of another flesh than all of mankind. And therefore, Jesus Christ could not save all of mankind because he is of a different flesh. And that's why in 1 John 4, 3 it says, The spirit of Antichrist denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, in the same flesh as the first Adam. And that is the problem that we have with this dogma. Maybe Tom wants to say something before I go start reading in the new chapter today to conclude this discussion we had today. Well, certainly I do. And uh, it's just to ask the listeners uh, a hypothetical question. And that is certainly by now the listeners can see why it's important for your pastors not only to tell you that Jesus is the Christ, but to also warn you, the papacy is the Antichrist. Now, these, these source materials that we've been reading so far in this program, Roman Catholic Dogma, Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, Roman Catholic uh, Official Teaching, Dogma. Catechism also, yeah. The Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. There needs to be in the true house of God, at least some understanding of what the Roman Catholic Church teaches because that will, that will educate you about who the Antichrist is 
and that will help to destroy the idea, the cockamamie idea, the Antichrist idea, that the Antichrist doesn't come until the end of time. It allows you to teach what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, what makes it diabolical in its, in, in its true being, is what's important for us to be able to distinguish the difference between the holy, which is Christ, and the profane, which is Antichrist. We need to know the difference and be able to talk fluently about the differences between Christ and and Antichrist. But if your pastor never shows you what makes, what it is that makes the papacy and every pope in succession from the first to the last to be the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, then you will be left in doubt about who the Antichrist is. You may continue to even believe that the Antichrist is a future single individual that doesn't come upon the world scene or is not a factor until just three and a half or seven years before Christ returns. And given that, never mind, because you'll all be raptured out of here. Let me tell you, it's straight from the pit of hell. This idea that that God's people will not suffer persecution and will be raptured out is straight from the pit. It takes away any care that you might have to discover who the Antichrist is. And they do not want you to know. The, the most closely held secret in all of Roman Catholicism, in all of the apostate, Protestant, and evangelical churches today is the uh, true identity of the Antichrist. He is not a future man of sin. He is an historical man of sin, a here and now man of sin, a future man of sin, all wrapped up from the first pope to the very last pope that sees Christ return. He is fulfilling every day the role of the man of sin, no matter in what human cloak he, 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 he displays. Whether it's Pope Innocent IV, whether it's Pope Boniface the, 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 you know, the Eighth, whether it's Gregory or Dominic or Clement or Paul or any of the papal names, they are all the Antichrist of their day. Not to forget Francis. Pope Francis, and, you know, you've heard that he's a Jesuit. Don't make any special distinction because he's a Jesuit. He's the man of sin, whether he's a Jesuit or a Dominican or a Opus Dei or no affiliation. He is the man of sin. He is the one who sits upon this earth in the robe of flesh that is covering his divinity. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. That's what you must believe if you are a Roman Catholic or anyone who is baptized. That includes you and me and everyone else. And uh, if you don't believe these dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, then you are by definition, by Roman Catholic definition, a heretic. And it is no sin to kill a heretic. More than that, it's a meritorious work to kill a heretic. That, according to the Third and Fourth Vatican Councils, the, the Lateran Councils, the, the Council of Constance, you can read about all these things in history. Now, it would rather behoove you to ask your pastor about these things. And if he can't tell you anything about them, he's not qualified to occupy the space behind the pulpit of the church. He's not qualified to reside in the sanctuary. Make him park his posterior out in the curb and find you a man of God carrying the King James Bible and a good history book, and you'll know the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Now, as I said, for the remaining of the time, let's go into the reading of End Time Delusions. We wanted to start a new chapter, which is chapter 9, that is called Falling Away from the Truth. 
And as every other chapter of this book, it starts with a quote. This quote comes from Flannery O'Connor, who lived between 1925 and 1964. So he didn't get that old, but he, um, quote unquote, uh, created the, 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 the quotation here that reads, the truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it. And as you already know, I much prefer a Bible verse in regard of reading this when we start reading the book of the end time delusions. And so I looked it up in the Bible and I found in Psalms 119 verse 142, quote, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. And here we are speaking of the law of the God of creation, Elohim, we are not speaking of the little God in Rome who takes his own law, Roman canon law, that we already spoke about earlier in this broadcast. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it? No, but we have to know what truth are we talking about. And if we are not talking about the truth that is derived from the word of God, then it is no truth. And that is something Flannery O'Connor, whether he had grown older or not, I am sure did not understand. So falling away from the tools, chapter 9 of the book End Time Delusions reads, Millions of Christians are now being taught that the Antichrist will be some evil person who will rise into power outside of Christianity after the rapture. But think with me for a moment. What if this idea is a horrible, horrible mistake? What if the Antichrist rises up inside of Christianity before the church is caught up to Christ. Because few would be looking for an Antichrist within. Can you imagine what kind of harm he could do? Now, hold on to your seats, for you are about to discover Paul taught this very thing. Paul wrote... In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, when, and uh, I put it in red here because I put the King James in here, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Yeah? So, again, with a little explanation. Paul wrote, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, when Jesus comes to gather us, will not or shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Almost everyone agrees these words predict the rise of the Antichrist. What many have missed is that Paul is describing an Antichrist that rises in the wake of the falling away. Now, what does this mean? Once again, a little knowledge of Greek comes in handy. Yeah? You remember that we were studying the word perusia earlier, coming. The original word for uh, Paul used for the falling away is apostosia, where we got apostate from in English, I guess which literally means an apostasy or departure from Jesus Christ inside the Christian church. In fact, many versions of the New King James Bible place the heading The Great Apostasy right above 2 Thessalonians 2. That is why we are not reading the New King James, but we are reading the King James, and from a few pages on after this, all quotations actually even come from the AV 1611 True King James Bible yeah? Not the 1769 Blaney edition I put in here so far But the True 1611 Bible I found a wonderful website where you can find all that And just allow me for one second to go there I want to show this to you uh, Because I was looking for that today That is this website here 
and uh, here you can speak of the uh, 1611, the AV 1611 King uh, James Bible. Um, when, for example, we go into what we are talking about here, Daniel, uh, for example, in chapter 9, um, this is now the first chapter here, we can go to Daniel chapter 9, and then we go, and then you see that it is a completely different kind of writing that you are used to read. This is the AV 1611, and this reads here, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. You see how different this English is from the English that you are used to. And we can also click on this and then we get an original scan picture of the Bible as it was written in 1611 and here next the verses to read them more easily. This is the same thing. And this is the Bible study, or this is the study Bible, sorry. This is the study Bible that will be used from, I think, page 73 on in this book. And maybe I will go through the labor of changing all these verses that I put in here and use they, those old verses because there are some interesting differences in there, especially when you go to Daniel chapter 9, because there you will see that um, it is addressed in verse 25 uh, about the prince. You can see here, Messiah, unto Messiah the prince. Yeah? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the prince in capital letters. You see that here. You also see in verse 26, the people of the prince that shall come. Also the prince in capital letters. What that actually means is maybe something Tom and I will speak about in another study and not the study of today because we only have a few minutes left and I really wanted to go a little bit into the book. But it is an important part that you understand that your, what you understand to be the King James Bible, what I for years understood to be the true King James Bible, is actually a revised version from 1769 and there are many, many changes in there. And I know there's even one, I, I don't know, come to his name right now, I don't have the book. But he wrote a book about, I think, more than 800 differences that are discovered between this, the real AV 1611 King James Bible, and the 1769 Blaney version that you can get everywhere. But once you understand that there are changes then you understand why you can buy a King James even from Zondervan printing. And Zondervan Publishing Company belongs to Rupert Murdoch. Why would Rupert Murdoch, a knight of uh, the uh, knight of Pope Gregory, uh, of the order of Pope Gregory, yeah, so a papal knight, why would he publish a true 1611 King James Bible? <laughs> he wouldn't. He publishes a 1769 quote-unquote, 1611 King James Bible. But as I said, that's for another evening. Except for Tom, of course, has a comment here, then I will always want to hear Tom's words on this. No, I, I, I think you've said plenty on it. And uh, uh, listen, Satan's primary objective for those who simply will not reject the Bible is to corrupt it, to change it, to m molest it to manipulate and to uh, diminish one's faith in it. And that's what Rome is so perfectly successful at doing. And uh, lately we've found even uh, reason to question the, 16, uh, the 1769 edition. And, of course, everybody says the 1611 uh, is the is the King James Bible, but they always quote from the 1769. So uh, we still have some more purgation to do. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for that elaboration on the subject. Now, continuing in the text, almost everyone agrees these words we just read, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three predict the rise of the Antichrist. What many have missed is that Paul is describing an Antichrist that rises in the wake of the falling away. Now, what does this mean? 
Once again, a little knowledge of Greek comes in handy. The original word of Paul by, used by the falling away is apostosia, which literally means an apostasy uh, or departure from Jesus Christ inside the Christian church. Outside the, uh, outside the church, they are always away from Jesus Christ anyway. Right? In fact, many versions of the New King James Bible place the heading. The great apostasy right above 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now to illustrate the connection between the falling away and the rising up of the Antichrist, imagine a boy who climbs a tree, stands on a branch, loses his footing and then falls away. After banging his head on the ground, a large bump starts growing on his forehead. Surely you can see the connection bef uh, between the boy quote-unquote falling away from the limp and the rising of the bump. It's the same with the falling away and the rising of Antichrist. As we are about to see in our upcoming study of this book, the falling away unquestionably takes place inside the church. In the first century, the Christian church remained relatively pure from heresy. It also remained relatively, not completely, but relatively pure, pure from false doctrine. And Tom just gave an example earlier this evening when he spoke of Hymenaeus and Philetus, right? Or what are these names? Hymenaeus, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Hymenaeus and Philetus. Said, who said that Messiah had already returned in the spirit when Paul said explicitly, Christ will not return until that man of sin is revealed, and the man of sin won't be revealed until there comes first a great falling away from the faith, a, a falling away. And that's what Hymenaeus and Philetus led. That is what uh, Simon Magus led and other members that used to be part of the church but who left the church and began to, uh, to, to accumulate followers for themselves that was the that was the the leading of the great falling away and it resulted in the establishment and the rise of the roman catholic church and the papacy and uh it wasn't until the time was right and that only was it, it was only right after a great apostasy and the and then and the new testament scriptures talks openly about that apostasy and it's up for your pastors to tell you and point out these apostasies that were arising within the church that ultimately led to the rise of the papacy and the roman catholic church and one of those uh, not only the ones we've already discussed but the idea that that constantine a civil ruler one of the great caesars of the Ro of, of the roman empire United Church and State. United Church and State. And you'll find in the Bible no such union. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So this is a prime example of false doctrine in the first century already. It didn't all happen later. It started in the beginning already. And the author says, and open sin. But with his cosmic perspective, God saw a change would come, and he revealed the sober reality to the writers of the New Testament. A brief survey of the following Bible passages shows plainly that an apostasy, departure or quote-unquote falling away from Jesus Christ was predicted to occur inside of Christianity. I call this the quote-unquote the big detour. And since we already have passed the hour, we will busy ourselves with this part of the book in the next reading. For today, I think we have studied many, many things um, that have probably, or I hope, set you up to do your own research, to gain even more and better understanding, and to help you use the right correct Bible, the AV 1611, this one here, 
that you can get at the quote-unquote Hendrix, uh, Hendrickson Bible if you want to, and measure everything that you study in the world against the Bible. And when you read through these pages of the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia and uh, NewAdvent.org and uh, through the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, then measure everything you read there against the Bible. And if that church claims to be the one and only true church, and it doesn't hold up against the word of the uh, against the word of God, what church have you gotten into? Have you really gotten into the Church of Christ, or have you maybe been deceived? Watch that no man deceive you, Paul said, into the Church of Antichrist. That's a question you have to answer honestly for yourself. And listen. If you don't answer that question honestly for yourself, you only betray yourself and the people you love. Think about it. Is that important to you? Make your decision based on your own study. We will provide the links and you can do your own study and we will see you back next week for another reading of this wonderful book from Steve Wahlberg, The End Time Delusion and I want to give the last words of today's broadcast to Tom, who so much deserves so much more airtime than even I can give him. Please, Tom. By now, the faithful listeners should be comprehending the solid logic behind my statement when I say, how is it that an all-righteous and an all-loving God would sacrifice his only begotten Son and send him to this world, giving up his throne of his glory and to take upon himself the body, flesh, and blood and bone of a fallen sinful man and then suffer, bleed, and die to redeem a fallen race of mankind and to reconcile them to God. And after all that, Leave those souls for which his son came to bleed and die to redeem. Leave them in jeopardy of being deceived and destroyed and damned by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the false Christ, the papacy. That's what your churches teach you. They teach you that Jesus is the Christ, that he redeemed us. But they fail to tell you about the man of sin, the son of perdition. And worse than that, even worse than that, worse than leaving you ignorant about the true identity of the Antichrist, the man of sin, the papacy, they are currently and have been and will in the future fashioning a reunion between Christ's blood-bought sons and daughters and the man of sin in Rome, an ecumenical unity between the blood-bought Christians of this world and those of the Roman Catholic Church, and to call it Christianity. That's what's happening in your church an ecumenical reunion between those who renounced the Antichrist 503 years ago are now being brought back under the spiritual and the temporal power and authority of the replacement of the Son of God on earth, the self-styled vicar of Christ who is none other than Antichrist, that's what the ecumenical movement is. It was conceived from morning, noon, and night to be the destruction, the final destruction of Bible-believing Protestantism and evangelicalism. And their program is, is parading right on time. Well, I intend to do everything in my power as long as I still have breath in my nostrils to reverse the so-called ecumenical movement and to save those for whom Christ came and bled and died to redeem. And I intend to do it by identifying 
scripturally and historically the true identity of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, the popes of Rome. I'll see you next time. The great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders and their idea about one generational responsibility, one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages. For the ages. That was the challenge they gave us. That is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth should result in public policy that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful. And so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. And neither do we. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue. To move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda.